What's up, man? How are you? Hey, how are you, Paul? You know, man, uh, working on month number three of the quarantine, I guess. Right. What are we at? Corona day what? Like 52 uh, or something? Or well, let's see. No, 54? you know what it's like? No, it's honestly, it's honestly day 58. 58. There you go. 58, man. Jeez. Big five eights. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of I don't know about you, man. I'm kind of tired of sheltering in place. I understand why we're doing it, but I'm getting really tired of staying home. <laughs> I wish I had yeah. another way to put it. I'm getting tired of staying home. Yeah. So um, you know, I'm playing a lot of disc golf, <laughs> walking my dog a lot, nice. trying to work out as much as possible. Wonderful. Day same. So, OJ, the last time we talked, we talked about trade shows. And then subsequently they had the digital online version of watches and wonders what's uh what's your take on that man how'd you feel about it what'd you think you know it was certainly nice to see some new releases you know it's nice to see like the light at the end of the tunnel i guess these companies are still going to make make watches even after quarantine right <laughs> yeah we so that's the that's the hope in the uh, that's the hope in the prayer right yeah yeah so um you know it, i mean the first i think the first um the first thought that came to mind in the presentation of it all was it's kind of overwhelming. You know, I mean, you go to the Watches and Wonders page, and I think there's, what, like 18 brands represented there? Uh, I think so. And out of, and all those brands, let's say there's, I don't know, like four watches for each of those brands, it seems like. Um, it seems like Panerai probably had more new releases than I think anyone else. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's what it seemed like to me. But um, you know, it seemed a little overwhelming. Like I said, 18 brands, and you got to leave the Watches and Wonders site to look at each brand's offering. Well, um, I'll, I'll tell you that however, dis, however that might have felt for you, for me it was just, oh, it was so much better than the way it's been in years past. You got to open up Hodinkee and a blog to watch and everywhere else and the brand sites and then refresh them constantly and hope that they put the information on there because sure. I've been I've – been, it's happened to me several times where you look for the information on the manufacturer website and it's just not updated. Sure. It's like, well, sure. everybody knows what it's going to be. Everybody knows how to update. You know, there's a whole team to update a website. I don't understand why they're waiting to do it until the week after SIHA or Watches and Wonders or Basel World or anything like that. I mean, yeah. it's, 20, it's, it's, there's no real excuse for not having your information up timely. So it, to me, it's kind of like if you look at Fashion Week in New York or Paris or Milan or whatever, you see these outfits, you know, on the runway and you think to yourself, well, who would ever wear that? Why would anyone buy that? You know, it just, it doesn't look like anything anyone would ever wear as a pedestrian, so to speak. And so when you look at these watches that they release, I kind of got the same feeling is it's haute, haute couture, it's haute horology. But it's not like working man pedestrian horology. You know, it's like the cheapest watch that I could find that was released as a new release was, I think, the IWC Automatic Portuguese. How know, much was like it? Five grand or something like that. Yeah, and all it right. is is an automatic version of the manual wine Portuguese. Oh, you know what? No, that's not true. The least expensive watch that I recall seeing was the re-release of the Bauman Mercier Hamptons. I think it's under okay. 3000 and I'm sorry, I, I, I discounted Bomb and Mercier because I just, I don't know, it's a brand that just kind of has left my purview, you know, sure, I just don't sure, see it as sure. a serious watch brand as my, as our business relates, as our customer base relates, sure. you know, um, I mean, sure, it's a great brand, it's owned by Richmond, yada, yada, but like I said, I don't, um, I, I'm talking about IWC, Jaeger, Le Coultre, Lang, I'm talking sure. about Panerai, you know, and again, it seems like everything there's nothing really new except for maybe they made a bunch of things a bit thinner. You know, Piaget released a, an ultra thin tourbillon that's, you well, know, it, crazy let's, thin. Let's, and Let's start with the Piaget. That Piaget was already previewed over the last yeah. several uh, iterations of SIHH and Watches and Wonders yeah. as a concept watch. Sure. And now their big claim to fame is this concept watch is now ready. Right. Okay. Right. Oh, of course, it's still produced on request only. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's like, oh, okay. And I'm pretty sure if you came you know. to the Piaget with half a million dollars over the last couple of years, sure. and you and said, hey, could you build me one of those? I'll bet sure. you they would have given it the old college try. And to me, it's like, you know, going to, if you see one of those outfits in, like I said, 
in, in fashion week and it's like sure. you're dressed up like a clown with everything but a red nose long shoes and you know that's yeah. kind of my regard to how i felt with the releases of watches and wonders it's so highfalutin so far out there that to me it, it didn't hit me you know where i was like ooh, with the exception like i said of panerai panerai for me there were some pretty cool pieces but you know looking at um uh, at Piaget, yeah. So they're they're known for their ultra thin complications, their thinnest movements in the world, and they're still doing that. Okay, show me something you know I haven't seen, and I'm right. not seeing that from them, anyways. Well, I mean, again, going back to what we were talking about with with watches and wonders, I personally felt like this was the best that they could do, considering they weren't really going to do a digital launch of all these watches. I think it was more about saying. Let's take what we normally do to supplement the in-person launches and really turn it up to 11. If they had, a, if they had another year to plan for an all-digital Watches and Wonders, we might have seen something different. But, you know, they put it together on a relatively short period of time. And mm -hmm. I'm pretty impressed with the way that they managed the results. I mean, certainly something's better than nothing. And I agree. Just about new pictures, new video, new media, new content – then, you know, you can certainly check the box that they did their job and they did release new content um, and some new watches that people hadn't previously seen. Sure. You know. Um, and, so I, and I mean, I'll definitely give a, give a tip of the hat to Hodinkee with their coverage because what they did was they put a, they put a standing sort of category on their, on their homepage that said yeah. all the 2020 new releases. So you could constantly yeah. reference one page. You didn't have to wait for – you didn't have to reload, refresh. And right. In years past, it's been kind of, a, it's been kind of less organized. So yeah, more again, I'm, shot. Yeah, I'm really glad that, that you're feeling more organization. Yeah. You know, there's, it, it is more – you know, so there's a central jump-off point. But the problem is once you jump off, you, you leave, and then you got to come back. You leave, and then you got to come back. That's with regard to the – organization of how you sort of navigate the watches of wonders on Hodinkee or the watches of wonders site itself. Well, it felt like it, every time you're, you're, you're closing the door to go to another room, then you got to close that door and go back into the main room again. Well, I mean, in that regard, it's not all that different. If every room has something different in it and you're just waiting in the main lobby, you're going to go from room to lobby from room sure, to lobby. I so sure, uh, again, I, I, I can understand your frustration knowing you as well as I do over the last, <laughs> what, 12 years. But I can tell you that as far as organization for a, for a normal human being, for lack of a better phrase, it was as well organized as you can put it because they're never going to centralize that information on a website. Sure. Sure. So, sure. Well, uh, what was but, the, so, so what did you like? Did you, you looked at the Piaget offerings? There wasn't, there wasn't a whole lot of depth there, you know? Well, was, I'll, t I'll tell you there. So, and I'm going to ask you the same question. I'll, I'll give you mine and then I'll ask you for yours. Is that cool? You want to do it that way? Sure. Sure. All right. So the watch I was most impressed with was the Hermes Arceau. Like yeah. that watch was amazing. Yeah. I just couldn't yeah. with I'm the Martian to... with the Martian dial. Oh, a hundred percent with the Martian with the Martian meteorite dial. I want to get the name right. So my my favorite watch of Watches and Wonders this year was the Hermes Arceau Leur de la Lune with the Martian meteorite dial. That watch yeah. was insane. I have never seen a watch like it. I remember when the when the Arso when the Arso uh, Leur de la Lune came out, and I was floored by that watch to begin with. So mm -hmm. overall, this is an excellent line extension, and I think they're only going to make one. So that's the reason why it really was my favorite watch. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. what did you think? What was your favorite watch overall? I really liked the uh, the glow in the dark Panerai, the green. The green panorama, you know. I, I had mean, a, I, I had such a feeling you were going to say well, the Luminor anniversary stuff. You know, I think um, if you look at the history of Panerai, you know, where they planted their flag wasn't making things glow in the dark. Agreed. And for the past twenty-five years, they've never really talked about that. I mean, yeah, their watches glow. Their watches have great luminous luminosity. You know, but but that that green one kind of brings uh, brings it to a new level in my opinion. Is it, so I was is, really impressed with that. Is it lumin? Is it luminosity or luminescence? Yeah, same difference. But <laughs> the point is, the point is, you can never have enough luminosity or luminescence on a watch. And Panerai oh, definitely, course. you know, to me, like that watch in the dark reminds me of the HYT watch 
you know, with the circle that indicates the dom. I just thought it was very cool. Well done. Sure. Um, it'll be interesting to see what it looks like, you know, in the daylight, like on the wrist in natural light. If you see that green, if it looks, you know, sort of unnatural or like it doesn't belong. But certainly the nighttime shots, I was very impressed with and I loved all that room. That did it for me for sure. For sure. Um, well, uh, now I want to talk to you about a watch I actually am considering buying. Yeah. Straight off the showroom floor, brand new, a really rare occurrence for either for both you and me. I don't recall the last time I bought a brand new watch for myself. I really have to think me? about it. The Mont Blanc Geosphere Titanium blue dial on the beads of rice bracelet yeah yeah the beads of rice is nice to see that back in circulation I, that was I like a good bracelet. It. i like it it's a high polished center it's all the beads are high polished yeah and all of the outer links are are matte titanium it uses that geosphere complication that mont blanc released two years ago and it's it's a real stunner i i mean Full disclaimer, I worked for Mont Blanc when they released the Geosphere originally. Sure. And I was just in love with that watch. And it went from a black iteration to a blue dial, uh, to a green dial iteration to the, now this blue dial. And the blue dial doesn't have any of that faux patina aged loom. It's got a nice white luminescence. Uh, the luminescent material is nice and white, so it looks like a brand new watch. And the change from that sort of old vintage you feel to a, to a fresh titanium case it really did it for me and i think the watch is like sixty two hundred dollars on a bracelet so that's yeah. the that's the one that i would probably go after and i probably will go after it before the year is over i just mm -hmm. i like the i like the watch i like the brand the people are nice and you know it's it's a it's it's a piece that honestly is uniquely more blown you know i love blue dial watches but i'm kind of over it a little bit it seems like everybody's going for the blue dial you know, as they're either boutique exclusive, you know, or as their new release, that's going to be limited production. And to yeah. me, it's like, come on, you couldn't come up with, yeah, blue's beautiful and all. I love the blue dial Panerais, love the blue dial Mont Blanc, love the blue dial Vacherons, APs, everything else. But can we, can we come up with something else? <laughs> well, Green? You, red? You know, I mean, Jaeger came out with red, but it had to be in a ladies' watch. They couldn't do that as a man's Jaeger reversal? I mean, come on. Well, you know, there's a long history of the watch industry trying color for men and it not working out real well. Blue yeah. is about the most adventurous color a man will try on a watch. It's sure. black, silver, or blue. Like, you don't have a lot of choices, and that's by design. But uh, yeah. was there any watch that you saw at SIH? Uh, at watches? I got to stop saying SIHH. Paul, watches and wonders Geneva. All right. You, anyway, you know, there was... I'll was tell there you anything that you I saw like. that you wanted to buy? A brand that I have been very intrigued by for the past, oh, I actually had one of these, is, is Rebellion. Rebellion really? watches. Yeah. They, they, you know what? I've always liked that. They, they had a watch that I bought about maybe six years ago, and it was a chronograph. And the thing about that watch was you could hit a button, and the chronograph would disappear. Or maybe it was a GMT, gosh, I it was like six years ago, but it was a rebellion watch and you could make, you could like, I don't remember what it was. If you turn the crown or what it was, either the numbers or the GMTs, or maybe it was just the full chronograph function just disappeared. I'm going to have to find a reference to it. But so I've always been a fan of rebellion. I think it's a cool brand. And I think their Bruno Senna was a pretty cool special edition. And sure. um, I, you know what? I think there's room for another cool sport watch that's sort of, motorsport infused a la richard mill but you know uh a tenth of the price sure. the average watch well you know it's, it's all it's, skeletonized lots of vibrant colors cool well, um i don't know what you call the, the the face and the pieces on the face but just really cool i mean you could feel like the the construction of that of that dial and it's like skeletal sort of sure i, I liked it it's worth mentioning to all of our to all of our friends and and family and and viewers watching at home that even if it was a tenth of the price of a Richard Mille, it would still be an absurdly expensive watch. Yeah, they're still they're still ten grand, but um, <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, like I said, I was all, trying to find a first watch of all, that was released for Watch of Wonders under ten grand, and it, you're hard pressed to do it, man. I'm gonna, you know, I'm you gonna need at, you to first of all, 
On top of that, I'm going to need you to find me a brand new Richard Mille with a sticker of $10,000 or $100,000. 100000 <laughs> Yeah. I don't think there is one anymore. Yeah, probably not. Probably but, not. Um, but my point is, if you said, you know, you, you the one watch you found, the least expensive watch probably that was released was that one that you were talking about. Yeah. You know, the which long, still, long, and everything well, else starts at like $12,000, even if it's steel, it seems like. Well, that's something interesting that I wanted to go back to. There's... There's a watch that I'm really, really rooting for to do well. And we touched on the brand earlier today, and it was the least expensive release at Watches and Wonders Geneva, and that's the Bomb and Mercier Small Seconds. Hampton sure. Small Seconds. The Bomb and Mercier Hampton Small Seconds is my pick for the watch that I'm really hoping is successful. Because, yeah, I mean, the Hampton was the, uh, that was their take on the Tank Francais, essentially. Well, but essentially. It was never big enough. Well, essentially, the Hampton was always going to be their kind of flagship model when they were really feeling that whole, like, beachside aesthetic a few years ago. And then it was, like, the, 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 the shaped case versus a round case. Because I feel like for a long time, the reason that people like you have, have written off Bomb and Mercier is because they went from a brand that tried new things to a brand that, all, that also did something. Oh, we also make a round watch. We also have a, a this complication. We also have a, a rotating bezel, and it and it went from a real brand that was unique and interesting to a brand that became essentially also ran. Yeah, you know, my um, I fell in love with the uh, the original Common Mercier Cape Land, the GMT Alarm. That was oh, one of my favorite good one. watches. I mean, that was the Panerai Radiomir Alarm GMT uh, movement. That was that Gerard Perigo Traveler Two movement. You know, I love that watch, and that was one of the first um, alarm GMT watches out there. You know, and and it was it was available at Mayer's. It was their big line, and we're talking about early two thousands. You know, like I said, Mayer's had Bomb and Mercier, and that was one of their big lines. And, and I owned that sure. that Cape Land GMT alarm and loved it. You know, but sure. it, to me, it just kind of got relegated to this sort of overstocked, sold out, steeply discounted brand that you could buy in Joma Shop at about forty cents on the dollar. Sure. I mean, that's listen, what Norman Mercier became for me over the past decade plus. Uh, I'll always have a soft spot in my heart for the Capeland Diver yeah. that they made with the with, oh, the, Kevlar, with the Kevlar dial, the all titanium case, and that, and that Texalium that, dial or whatever it yeah. was, that carbon fiber dial. Yeah, it, it, it was it was Kevlar the dial. Kevlar. That was a re- yeah, it was amazing, and they had like the textile strap with the yellow. Yeah, picture. the ballistic NATO strap. Love, cool. I love that watch. That watch is that watch is the only watch I ever regretted selling, and was because one of the first watches to show that sort of contrasting fluorescent colored hour markers. Remember, they were like orange. They were. I, I remember them being very very bright. Yeah, yeah, and you didn't but, see that in watch. And this, mind you, this is a watch that came out two thousand five. 2005, you didn't see those really bright numbers. No, I, and in 2005, the 42 millimeter grade five titanium case, it was a big watch. There yeah. was a lot of watch in 2005. But yeah. Um, yeah, and I, think, I think that's what Watches and Wonders this year is missing. You didn't see anything that you said, wow, that's cool. Everything seemed to be, you know, like I said, a reproduction of something they made last year or the year before or something they've sure. been fiddling around with and well, saw you know, glimpses of, and now here it is available for purchase. Well, I'll, t- I'll tell you that in general, when you look at sort of the Swiss watchmaking timeline, you see a banner year, an evolution year, and then like a tweaking year, then it's another banner year. Yeah. And I, would just, argue that, sure. and I would argue that the last banner year in Swiss watchmaking was 2017. So this is sort of the end of that tweak, of that cycle, <laughs> is what I think. And was there, is there a watch, is there a watch, is there a brand, is there a company, is there anything that you're rooting for that you saw at SI, uh, Watches and Wonders Geneva? Mm, I'm going to get it. Well, you know, I did like the, uh, the Jaeger, the Master Control, yeah. uh, Master Geographic Redux. That looked pretty mm-hmm. nice. Sure. I did it, and, and I think they're making it at 42 millimeter, which is a good size, sure. and they made it a little thinner too, it looked like. So love those blued steel hands on the white dial. I think that's a really pretty watch. I really like that. Um, right. You know, and I'm a- sort of rooting. I'm sort of rooting for the Lang uh, Odysseus. You know, really? released last year, retreaded this year. I don't know, but you know, they're you know they've got they're like a one horse pony. You know, everything looks like a Lang one or a Datagraph. 
you know? And so this is something totally different. Although with the name Odysseus, I think of that original Jaeger Lacoutre, you know, uh, line, the Odysseus line, which is sort of faded to, you know, die in obscurity. But well, my at least point you know, being, at least you know the trademarks were at least you know the trademarks were cheap to transfer from one Rishmar yeah. company to another. Sure, but, sure. Uh, no, I mean, I remember the Odysseus being a real kind of, for lack of a better phrase, a real fart in church when it came out in steel. Yeah. And, I mean, that's to say just the opinion-wise. I mean, I'm sure Longa dealers have something much different to say to us about it. I'm sure it was sure. the most successful Longa ever made. But, um, yeah, I mean, the fact that they, that they released it in white gold before they changed the dial color does not scream confidence that, I mean, that's their idea of innovation. <laughs> right. I mean, they have the steel version. Why not expand the steel version? Oh, no. What we're going to do is we're going to expand it in a white gold. Right. Make people pay it, three times more for it. Right. It was already a pretty expensive watch in steel. And now it's yeah. going to be a pretty expensive watch in gold. So Actually, it's not. And I think the steel one was like, wasn't it about 18000 or something like that? I think it was more. More? We'll put it. Well, yeah, we'll put up a graphic right here where the numbers. Right, and in be. white gold, it's like thirty-one thousand or something. I don't know. Yeah, I'll tell you. I what, want. What, I want to say they were really. I want to say the number is a lot closer than it should be. One watch that definitely caught my eye was the uh, the Vacheron Overseas, the Perpetual Calendar Skeleton. Oh That's yeah. Watch. You know, clearly man, playing on that AP open worked concept. Man. You know, just Man, you. if there was a brand in the Richemont catalog that I want to succeed more than anybody, it's Vacheron. Because well, they make listen, so their many overseas great pieces. are on fire. Stainless steel overseas right now are one of the hotter pieces, and they're very few and far between. Well, I mean, do you think that's because they were available when, like, the, the Nautilus and the Royal Oak were not, and then they just became a cult favorite? I mean, I think people love that blue dial. Mm -hmm. I think people love, you know, it's, um, you know, with as many pieces as were out there when they released them during the closeout years, circa 2013, 14, 15, you'd think there'd be a lot more of them out there. And I remember when those things were available at, you know, 45 cents on a dollar on a retail mm -hmm. basis, you know. So um, it's interesting that there's not many of them around anymore. And, they, and they're all you know, on a retail of like, I think it's 22,000 or something for the chronograph. They have I mean, a they're, very, they're like 18,000 pre-owned. They, they had a really, all I remember when they were released, and this was the only thing that made me sad about it because the watch was beautiful, intelligent strap, uh, intelligent strap bracelet design, intelligent removal. You know, it was a very well thought out piece, but that was where they chose to premiere a whole new family of movements so the watches were not competitively priced against yeah. the competition. Sure. I remember saying to myself, why would any, like, I love this watch, but why would anyone buy this watch over a Royal Oak? Sure, for $22,000 for a stainless yeah. steel. You know. Yeah, yeah for something thing, like, did you notice that they're doing a new uh, quick, uh, a quick release strap changing system on the well, uh, overseas? Oh, yeah, when they re-released the overseas a couple of years ago, before they when, after they closed out all those old ones, Right, the new overseas released with a new strap changing system. It's all one click, and yeah. then they also released the new calibers, and that's why the watch was so expensive. I just remember yeah. being floored by it. Well, yeah, and that rose gold uh, open work, you know, the skeleton uh, perpetual. It comes sure. with like two extra straps and an extra rose gold deploy folding deploy yeah, it, buckle. It, it's, and, an, it's insane. <laughs> yeah, but it's but, nice. Uh, I mean, I I think that it, it's a you know if you're gonna go with the quick with the quick release then you might as well include extra straps. Agreed. Agreed. You know, but it does well, make the, uh, it does push the, uh, the retail prohibitively. So. Right. Well, OJ, last question before I let you go, and this is not going to make me any friends, any more friends over at Richemont HQ, but the disappointment of the fair for me, as it has been for the last several years was Cartier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, honestly, Universally. I, didn't look, I didn't even look at Cartier. I could kind of, it was just lost on me. I, I could kind of care less what they're up to it's, right now. It's sort of a dangerous thing to ever say because I like Cartier a lot. They've done some really great stuff over the years. But the Pasha, they re-released the Pasha. They re-released the Pasha. And See, I, I was like, 
You know what? That's the one brand when I was looking at the menu of all the brands, I had absolutely zero interest in clicking it. All I go. said all I said to myself was, okay, so last year it was the uh last year it was the Santos. Mm -hmm. The yeah. year before the year before it was the Panther. It was the Panther. It was the Panther, wasn't it? So yeah, it's like everybody, I recommend everybody watching this video go and immediately call their grandma and see if they have, if, see if she has a Cartier watch and she'll have one of the three Cartier watches that was released in the last three years. Yeah. It's almost a guarantee. I was like, what? Uh, wow. And my prediction for next year, if all this goes the same as watch, we're going to see the next version of the Cartier Roadster is what's going to come out next year. At well, you know, way. and it seems to me like Cartier's strategy may be they're, they're focusing on making their money on their jewelry, doing the hot horology with the super high-end tourbillon, ultra-thin pieces and things like that. And, and then it's just the rehash of everything they've done, you know, on a mass but, market jewelry, you know, watch jewelry basis. But I don't – what I will never understand is if it was so popular, why did you discontinue it in the first place? Yeah. And if it was so bad that you needed to discontinue it, why would you re-release it? Sure. Well, it's to just, me, you know, Cartier's always been a jewelry brand, and it's always been a brand more in favor with women than with men, and it's always been extremely susceptible to the trends, the moods, and, you know, what's hot, what's not of the, of the time. And that's sure. something that's always kind of scared me about, you know, Cartier watches. Um, and... Uh, like I said, I, I didn't even look at their new releases. I, I, I don't know why. I just didn't. I was like, eh, Cartier. Eh, I'll move on. Was Looked it, at everything was, else? Hey, did you what, see the? Uh, did you see the new release? Um, uh, Doxa. Uh, Doxa's the got carbon, a new the, release in, the in forged, uh, carbon. forged carbon fiber. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's but pretty it's pretty neat. It's not it's a five. It's a five thousand dollar Doxa. Yeah. No, I think it's six actually. Oh, okay, I think it's six. six. Yeah, so I mean, it's probably the I most mean, expensive Doxa that you've ever seen. But, you, you know, interesting anyway. Yeah, no, it's a very interesting watch, but you almost want to call the folks at Doxa and say, hey, listen, buddy, there have been literally hundreds of case studies in the market where you release a watch like that and people don't get it. Yeah. Like, they just well, don't price understand Price point it. wise, it's insane. I mean, the average person spends 1500 bucks to $2,200 on a Doxa. You know, yeah, now not, you I mean, this. And then the release they had before that was the thousand dollar Doxa. Yeah. So what what message are you trying to send? It's like while you're also making the line cheaper, here's this here's this watch that costs seven times as much as a normal Doxa. Yeah. Hey, what did you think of Roger Dewey's releases? I like them. I well, I always like Roger Dewey's releases. I think they're always yeah. so interesting. They're visually kind of they're always visually very stunning, and they speak to the sort of the artist in all of us. Sure. But what always scares me about Roger Dubuis is serviceability. Mm -hmm. sure. So whenever you see, you know, like the turbine, like the double, quad, the double and the quadruple turbulence, that's fine. They've obviously got that down to a science. But when you start seeing, that's why they don't really do calendars anymore or anything like that. Like, sure, they they've eliminated the customer service problems, which I have to sure. give them credit for. Well, but. Every one of those straps is rubber and designed to be cut to fit. And I know from experience what a freaking nightmare it is trying to get new straps that haven't been cut. Well, cut to fit, cut to fit's a real commitment. Yeah. And if you're going to do that, if you're going to do that, you might as well make the product available. My gosh. I mean, at least Rolex makes those, makes their Oyster Flex straps available at the dealer level, you know, remotely, you know, somewhat easy to get. Well, but Roger Dupuy, I, I mean, just from years past, I remember waiting, I think, six months for a, a strap for an Aquamare. You know? Yeah. Well, let's speak about that for one second. Uh, when you look at a company like Roger Dupuy and you look at a company like Rolex, Rolex, can, Rolex has the leverage to tell you to buy a strap kit for the Oyster Flex. Even yeah. if that strap kit's $20,000, guess what? You're going to buy a strap kit for an Oyster Flex. It's guaranteed. Sure. Whereas Roger Dewey doesn't have that, well, not draw. They don't have that sort of. They don't have that same leverage. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know. Sure. If a if a brand helps me move through millions of dollars in inventory, and they ask me to support them with a twenty thousand dollars draft kit, done. Just sure. mail it. 
Put, I mean, how many, put a how bill many in authorized the box. dealers of Roger DeBuy you think there are in the country, in the U.S.? Six? You think there's, you think there's even 10? I, I think there's, um, I mean, I only know of two offhand, the one in Colorado. Um, uh, well, there's and, one here and, in, there's, and, um, there's, and there's one, there's one here in Miami. Yeah. Well, listen, we'll do the research. We'll put the number right next to my head over here and <laughs> it'll be fine. It'll just pop up like a bing. There's actually like 17. Like, the magic of, of post editing. I, yeah, post production is amazing because you can do <laughs> stuff like that. But yeah, man, I mean, overall, with Watches and Wonders, I personally didn't feel that much of a difference. They were like, oh, it's this all online thing. But when you're not physically at the trade show, you're you're con- you're consuming the media the same way. I mean, sure. I've always worked. I've always traditionally worked for Basel World Brands. So I'd have to watch Watches and Wonders Geneva coverage on Hodinkee and a blog to watch like everybody else. Sure. And even when I was at Basel, it's easier to consume than it is to actually look at the watch itself. It's easier to look at the information than the watch itself. The best story I have for you about that is I was walking past the Rolex uh, booth one morning, but I was looking at my phone reading about the GMT Master II with the Pepsi bezel. When they did it in white gold, I was reading about the watch. I could have turned to my left, immediately to my left, and looked at the watch. But, but it was easier to look at the pictures on your it, phone. It, right? it was easier to read the information. It really was. And, and I mean, uh, it, it's a story for another day, but it's like I don't even know why people would want to go to a trade show. It's not that interesting. Yeah. Well, I think that's uh, sort of a sign of the times, you know, as we talked previously. That, sure. uh, you don't need to do it anymore. You don't need to yeah, do it. Just like you don't need to go into offices to work in offices. Pretty much. I mean, pretty much. You know? Don't get me wrong. I mean, absolutely, buddy. Listen, in the meantime, to everybody that, that, that watched to the end, thank you so much for watching. You know, you've just heard. Uh, yeah, and, wearing, you know, we'd, we'd love to get your comments, your feedback, if you agree, if you disagree. You know, we'd love to sure. be your primary distraction. So yeah, if there's sure. uh, anything that we can do for you, you can feel free to call us. You can feel free to hit us up on uh, – on Facebook or on Instagram or on any of our social media channels. But, you know, we'd love to share our passion for watches, love to share our experience and love to talk about, you know, predictions and uh, what we see for the future. Absolutely.